Sounds good. Sorry. Hello and welcome everybody. I am surprised because I'm always startled by my own computer. So welcome today to the NHSR community monthly webinar and I'm going to just launch straight into introducing James Laird Smith who's going to give you a bit more information about what he's going to do and do his presentation. Thank you very much. James over to you. Thank you, thank you. I wonder if I can uh, stick this in the um, in the chat. So, I don't even see the chat. Oh well, oh, maybe it's. Uh... Yes, yeah, so I think the chat is disabled for today's session. I'd forgotten to say Q and A. I will see those and I can do those questions at the end or throughout if you want, James. But um, if you want to share that, I can share that with the information later. Yeah, 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 yeah. The website. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so uh, hello everybody uh, and, and thank you for uh, for, for joining. Um, the uh, slides for today's talk are already online um, and uh, yeah the, they'll be shared in, uh, for the and the links will be made available to you. Uh, the topic I thought about talk uh, I'd like to talk to you about today is about uh, broadly customizing your R experience. So I'm going to get into exactly what that is but um, uh, if there are questions in the in the chat, I'm yeah. It, this can be very interactive. I, I don't think we'll, uh, the the slides will take a, a full hour, so um, feel free um, to to interject if there are questions in the, in the slides. Oh, sorry, yeah, in the in the chat. Um, but the the kind of starting point is uh, for this talk is that I think that R is already. Uh, a fantastic environment for interactive programming. And I think that if you are coming along to a webinar like this, you probably agree. Um, uh, in addition, I think you probably also know about RStudio and uh, kind of appreciate how good RStudio is as uh, an IDE for, for working with R. Uh, but the topic of this presentation is kind of moving beyond the defaults. So a lot of people, including me, when for, for a long time, didn't really move beyond the defaults of working with either R or RStudio. So uh, this this feature of, of, of being able to, to customize your your IDE or customize your experience of the language is, is going to be the topic of this talk using what I am going to call like workflow shortcuts because I couldn't think of a better name. Uh, so what is a workflow shorter shortcut? Well, something which I have just you know uh, coined the term for, uh, but it's just the collective term for uh, a couple of things which you already know exist, but I'm going to give you some examples of how you can use them. Uh, to, to their fullest effect. So the one of these is quite well known, which, you know, keyboard shortcuts. Um, the other is uh, things are, I'm going to talk about are like your IDE options, your interactive, like create, how do you might create interactive convenience functions uh, or how you might modify this, uh, our startup scripts. So uh, no doubt some of you will know some of these things. Uh, some of you might know a lot of these things, but I, I hope that there's there's nuggets in in everything that I'm saying, which uh, will work for all of you, uh, or at least some of you will will learn something out of that. So uh, before I do that, though, I'm going to talk about why you might want to do this. So the the problem statement which I've outlined here is that learning new things is hard, um, and the thing that you might uh, question is whether it's worth spending time uh, investing in your workflow experience, uh, which is something which you don't see immediate dividends for, um, uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, I'm saying or I'm putting to you is, is valuable. And uh, whenever I think about this, I think about control C, control V. So everybody knows what control C and control V do. Um, and I want you to go back. I want to you to imagine your lives um, back going you know, into the edit menu and selecting copy and paste. Um, and I want you to imagine doing that for every time you wanted to copy paste something. Now, nobody actually does this by now. Everybody knows control C and control V. Um, but there was a time in your life probably where you had to learn uh, how to what control C and control V do, uh, even if it was a very long time ago. But now that you've practiced it, there's probably no way that you're going to go back to doing uh, edit copy and edit paste. Um, there's there's simply no way, and there's um, and you would find it very very frustrating if you were to try and do that. So I think that this is like uh, this tells us something about the world. So there's no doubt things 
that we are doing, every single one of us, including myself, which is frustrating, which is just something which you just have to do for some reason because it's hard, which uh, but uh, is but you do anyway because you just think that there's no better way to do it. Um, that uh, is obviously true for every one of us. My particular philosophy in life is to actually be guided by my frustration. So whenever I am frustrated by something, I see that as a sign that actually that probably requires a workflow improvement. And it might be worth investing on in a workflow shortcut or uh, some other kind of uh, tool to help me get over this frustration. Um, yeah, again, my life philosophy is to be very, very averse to frustration. So to to not base to um, to not just suck it up and deal with it, but to but to make like that frustration your friend and cling on to that frustration um, as a motivator to 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 learn a new way of doing things potentially. And we're going to go through lots of examples of that. If you don't believe me, there's a there's an SNBC comic which kind of explains it for you. Um, uh, this is uh, just hell. You know, this is this is the the hell that you have to experience every day. And you know, my my philosophy in life is to to make friends with the hell, like to to, to understand the frustrations, um, and to try and learn from them and, and make them better. So I'm going to start with our studio. So uh, we'll get on to to our specific things, but I'm going to start with the IDE focused things, which are and go on to exactly how to to, to automate them a bit later, but. Um, our, our studio, for those who might not know, is actually surprisingly extensible as an IDE. There's like lots of things which you can do in our studio or change about our studio uh, to suit your needs and preferences, which maybe not a lot of IDEs do. And I'm going to focus on it because I know that almost everybody on this call will use our studio as their primary IDE. Um, I, will, I have noted here that there are other IDEs and if you really want to delve into customizability, you might think about looking into Emacs. So Emacs has the ESS package, which um, is uh, Emacs just in general is, is perhaps the most extensible um, text editor that, that exists potentially. Uh, uh, a, a lot of tooling, uh, a lot of the R tooling in VS Code has also become very good. So some of you will perhaps have experimented with it, or uh, if you don't, you, you might want to look into um, experimenting with it. The, yeah, uh, my experiences so far with with VS Code, I don't use it primarily every day, but it's also becoming very, very good. So, some of the things that you can do with RStudio just on a very low level, I've outlined here. So, RStudio has the RStudio API package, which is an R package which allows you low level control over the IDE. So, I've put some of the functions there on the screen, and their names kind of suggest what they do. So if you want to open a project in R Studio, you don't have to click open project every single time. You can run R Studio API colon colon open project and then um, give it some arguments and basically programmatically access the features of the editor. Very similar, you can also you can do the same with apply theme. So you know, uh, unsurprisingly, you can give it the name of a theme and it will change that theme again programmatically. At an even lower level, you can set things like the cursor position, which is again, you can run a function in your console and it will set the cursor position that our studio is pointing to within the IDE. Now, that's very low level control. Mostly you don't have to do this. So it's much more likely that somebody else has wrapped up that functionality in a package already, uh, which gets uh, made as an add in. And so there's a uh, a lot of things I'm going to be telling you about now are our studio add-ins, which you can uh, download and, and it becomes available in our studio. Um, we'll just wrap this functionality, but it's also good to bear in mind that if you do have something very bespoke that you want to do, the R Studio API package is there for you uh, and you can do quite a lot of creative things uh, if you put your mind to them. So the first example is data pasta or data pasta, uh, which is a um, an R Studio add-in, and I've uh, taken a, um, a GIF from their um, from their repository. But this is a way of copying, pasting data from the web, basically. So this example is from um, weather data, but once you you copy and paste it to your system clipboard from your from your browser, but when you paste it in R Studio, um, it gets pasted as a tibble or a, or as a data frame, and uh, or more 
precisely the code which is necessarily to create a data frame. So this is again something which you could spend time doing, right? You know, you can transcribe data from the internet, or you can, you know, clean it in a in its raw form, or do something similar. But you don't want to do that. Uh, there's already a package available to you which which enables you to do that. Uh, by the way, everything that I'm talking about here is um, I'm going to provide links to, to all of them. So when you get the slides, um, uh, if you, you look them up afterwards, you, you'll be able to see links to, to all of those. The next thing which I make a decent amount of use of is the wrap RMD package. Um, and so this is also an RStudio add in, which is just that if you want to fit your freeform uh, pros, uh, which you write in Markdown or R Markdown, and you want to fit it to a fixed width, then again, uh, you can you can set this to a to a, a shortcut or a command, and you can run a function which will basically change the text or format the text so it's to uh, a fixed width or reflow it to a fixed width rather. Uh, the next thing is there is uh, the styler package. So the styler package is something that I really like. Um, so it's uh, there's a number of functions built into it, uh, but all of them are to do with styling your R code, and so. Built into the package, there's a number of style guides, so the different ways of formatting your R code, uh, which conform to a bunch of what are called style guides, which are built into the package. You can make your own as well, but most mostly you'll stick. You want to stick to the the built-in style guides, and uh, the styler package allows you to to select text and format it according to a style guide. Uh, now. Uh, and this it does so statically, so it, it just uh, takes your text as input and, and changes it. But that's made very, very easy by the, the R Studio ad. Now, if you're like me on how I used to be, then you maybe think, no, 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 I want to format my code exactly like I want, and I will hit enter and space, and I will like put in every single one of the changes which I want to do. Uh, and I used to be like that, um, and I, I understand like wanting to to like get the exact sort of style you want. But uh, uh, again, sometimes I found that frustrating and being guided my, by, my frustrating, by my frustration, sorry, a lot of the times I now just use Styler, which is just, uh, there's a certain freedom that comes from just like writing your code down and whatever like messy format it happens to be in, you can just run Styler style um, or style selection and it will just format it for you. Um, and I have found subsequently, as this is a kind of revelation for me, which is that I just it just helps me think a whole lot faster, where I don't have to think about the um, the, the different ways of, of styling my code or or what the appropriate one is. So if you if you haven't tried it before, I, I highly recommend Styler and giving Styler a shot. Um, uh, it, it really does save a lot of cognitive overhead, which I think is the whole point of a lot of the things that I'm I'm going to show you demonstrate. So the next thing is also uh, really fantastic. It's the the shortcuts package, which is uh, shortcuts spelled sort of without vowels. Um, uh, and it's a way for you to automatically set our studios own shortcuts. Uh, and that's not hard to do. Again, you can do this yourself in, within the IDE. There's a there's a menu item for it. But the short way the shortcuts package really shines is it gives you a way to programmatically set all of your shortcuts, which then they can be saved. And you know, if you get a, a new IDE or you, you uh, um, upgrade your your R Studio, you don't have to change them again. And if you change, if you happen to use two different systems, like I do, if you work at home and if you work, um, and if you have a, a computer that you use for work, uh, then you can just have one file and it can be version controlled, and you can get all the benefits. The shortcuts package has this syntax, uh, which is a file. So again, it's just an R file. Um, and these are an example, this is an example taken from some of my R Studio shortcuts. And they have this syntax, uh, which is a bit like Roxygen. So the, my first command, which I've highlighted here, is to restart R Studio, which I have bound to Control Alt Shift R. Uh, you can bind it to whatever you want, whatever makes sense to you. And uh, when I call Control Alt Shift R, it runs R Studio API execute command restart R, which is just yeah my shortcut for restarting R, which um, you should do often and always. Um, the next one, uh, as a different example, is go to definition. If you don't know about go to definition, it's just a really uh, useful way of if you have a um, a function which is being used, 
you can, in my case, hit control dot, and it will just take you to that where that function is defined in your source code or uh, or in a in a package or wherever. And in my case, yeah, um, that I I bind by RStudio API execute command go to definition, um, and uh, I'll show you. Ah, oh, this is unkind. Oh well. Let's uh, try open that up elsewhere. Uh, hopefully people can see that once again and not see my ad block. Fantastic. Um, so that's really useful. I, I just explained to you on the previous slide uh, there's uh, what uh, the wrap RMD package. And so uh, this is a, a function within a package, so it's not calling the RStudio API, but I have this bound to control shift W and um, uh, this calls the wrap RMD add-in, which again is just a very convenient shortcut for me to, um, uh, if I just select a, a whole bunch of text in a R markdown, it just fits it to, uh, it reflows it to a fixed width. And I was finding I was really, really hating having to do that myself. And so the function just does it for me and it's great and I never want to go back ever. Um, uh, control Alt Shift W is not maybe the best choice for you. I just happen to have a, like one key on my keyboard which uh, presses all three of those at the same time, but you don't need to be a keyboard junkie like me. You can you can, re uh, you can change that to whatever, um, uh, whatever um, keyboard shortcut or hotkey makes sense for you. Uh, is are there any questions in the chat which I should stop at? Um, fantastic, cool. So the next section uh, which I want to go into now we've talked about some examples of how to customize the IDE. Um, uh, I have a slightly more elaborate section which is just talking about how to customize R itself. So not about the IDE per se, but about like your experience of using the language. And R has this thing, for those who don't know, which is called a dot R profile file. So this is a special file that lives somewhere on your machine, which I'll talk about. And it contains uh, the R code that will run every single time that your R session starts up. And so it has a, a sort of special place in the, um, in the composition of the language and that uh, R knows where to find it and it knows uh, to, to run that file if it, if it does exist. It happens to be located in R's home directory. It should be in R's home directory. Uh, if you want to open it up for yourself or create it, uh, there is a convenience function that use this package, which is edit underscore R underscore profile. And so it will open up your R profile for you at the appropriate place for your operating system. So you don't have to find it yourself. There are a lot of programming languages which use this kind of um, file. Uh, it's sometimes called an RC file. So if you know a VimRC uh, file, that's uh, the equivalent for, for people using Vim. If you use Emacs, it will be something called init.el, which is the, the, um, the code that runs when you start Emacs. But for R, we have the .r profile. Collectively, these types of files are called dot .files. They're called that because they very often start with a dot, and so they're hidden by default like in your um, in your window manager, often they're hidden by default or by your operating system, but they mostly start with a dot and so does our profile, so it's, it's the dot R profile file. So like I said, this is uh, a file of R code which will run every single time that R starts up. And I'm gonna show you uh, uh, some extracts from my dot R profile file that you might be able to steal and, and use and, and augment to your own purposes to customize the way you want R to behave. Uh, the, I've also noted here that uh, it's, you don't just have my word for it, you can also go to uh, another prominent uh, R user is Jim Hester, who used to work at our studio, now works at Netflix, um, but his dot files he's also made available, so you can go and, and check them for, for inspiration. His dot uh, R files, sorry, his dot files probably a lot better than mine, but you, you know, you can, you can pick and choose the parts that you want to use and the things that you might find valuable. But I'm going to go through some examples uh, uh, of that. But before I do, there is a note of caution. Uh, two, in fact, notes of caution. So it's very, very tempting to, to want to put more and more things in your R profile. And I understand that. Um, 
But the first item of caution is you don't want to uh, do things which might compromise the reproducibility of your scripts. And I have two examples to illustrate. So it's totally fine to put something like options max.print in your R profile, because that's something which is specific to you and the way you want uh, output to appear in your console. Um, and so you want to see like max print 40 or max print 100. That's just the amount of output that you want to see. And that's totally fine and perfectly legitimate to put in your R profile. Something like uh, library tidyverse is not a good idea to put in your R profile. Even if you often find yourself calling library tidyverse, it's not a good idea to put it in your R profile, tempting as it might be, because the readers of the, the code that you subsequently write are not going to know what that you loaded library tidyverse, or they're going to have to guess at the kind of things which were in your R profile as you were working. Um, and that's uh, just a bad for for reproducibility. So in general, you should want you should favor things that are about your subjective experience, but that aren't necessary for other people to know at all. Um, and to try and keep your scripts as um, uh, as uh, try and keep a, a as clean of a um, an R session as you as you can uh, to mimic the people who will have to run your scripts in future. The second thing that you want to bear in mind is you don't want to unconditionally load packages in your R profile. And the reason is because these can cause problems if you want to install packages later on. So if you, for example, imagine that you loaded like library um, dplyr every single in, like you put it in your R profile and so it got run every single time you started R. Eventually you're going to have to install a new version of dplyr. Uh, and every time you try and do that, it's going to tell you actually dplyr is already loaded and you shouldn't like try and uh, update a running package and you're going to try and uh, restart R. But again, it's going to load dplyr. And so uh, that's going to be a, a problem for what you install in the package. Even worse uh, is also it might also be a, prob a problem for the dependencies of your package. So if you try and uh, like RCPP might be a um, a dependency of dplyr, but uh, if you try and update RCPP, but you've loaded dplyr, it's not going to let you do that either. So in general, you want to be quite cautious about uh, loading packages, and I'm going to show you some examples of how you might do that. Um, the best way to do it is to just wrap them in a function that you call selectively, uh, but uh, don't actually load the package in, the, in your R profile itself. But again, there'll be some examples of that. So let's get started. Um, the first thing is, uh, these are just some examples of things in my R profile, um, and uh, I've grouped them into several categories, but the first thing is just preferences. So uh, these are not things which are particularly exciting, but uh, the first thing is max print, which you saw before. I also turn off like connection observer, which is about um, uh, connecting to databases uh, because it just, it gets in the way uh, when I try and do it at work. Um, you can also load package specific stuff, so not about loading the package itself, but these are options that the package will use if it is set. So tidy versus quiet is one of those. So you just, if you load tidy versus, you don't get uh, verbose output. But also if you use the styler package, it uses a cache and you can choose what type of cache. You can set that option without loading the styler package itself, and uh, the options are a good way to do that. Even if it's a package option, you can still do it. You won't actually load the package. And so all of these are preferences, which are which are either preferences or, or package options, which are totally fine to to load in your in your R profile. And um, yeah, you should you should feel free to to be quite liberal with with those. The other thing which you might want to to load uh, in your R profile is just some custom logic for things that you might use either in the rest of your R profile or you might use. Uh, in different uh, ways. So the one thing which I'm is kind of just a demonstration for now is I have this convenience function in my R profile, which just tells me whether I'm in R Studio or if I'm running it from like VS Code or if I'm running it for like in a in a terminal or something, or if I'm running R in a terminal or something. And the way to do this is you just like take the command args argument with the first um, uh, the first item in the command args argument, and with, if that's R Studio, then you're on R Studio. Otherwise, it's it's false. Um, fun fact: I have I have a whole Twitter thread about how this is the correct way 
to work out if you're actually on our studio or not through lots and lots of trial and error. And you can go and read that Twitter thread if you want to find all the wrong ways to do it. Um, but yeah, for convenience, you can go and you can you can use this function uh, just to, for example, you can put it in if statement. You can say if you're on if you are on our studio, then load up these keyboard shortcuts, for example, or anything that you want to do. Um, you always then have this convenience function available to you. Here are some other functions. So I have a function for determining whether I'm at work uh, or not. So if my system.info user is James Laird Smith, then uh, I, I am not at work. Then actually, uh, uh, then I'm uh, then I'm at home. But otherwise, I'm at work. And so there's a convenience function which I've called at underscore work, which just determines whether I'm at work or not. And using that, I can then make another function. So yeah, I wanted a convenience function that just tell you know. I know what my email is, but sometimes I want to put my email into like code or just like have it like ready to hand without having to type out every single thing. So I have a convenience function which is called my underscore email. And again, I can like it's this is our code, right? So you can put in like arbitrary control flow uh, or stuff of that nature. So if I'm at work, I return my bank email address. If I'm not at work, I return my personal email address. And so that's just a uh, a way that uh, I don't have to go back and change like my email address depending on where I am working from. It's just there, always available for me. So the next thing, people who do a bit of package development know that the use this package has a couple of options. So the one thing is it just like it lets you autofill like your name, uh, your surname, your um, uh, your orchid, or um, the version of the package which you default to start on. Um, and uh, all of those are just normal package options that you can set. Um, you don't actually, these aren't actually loading the use this package, but um, they're just, um, they're, they're available if the use this package does get loaded. But you can see I can use, uh, I want to set my email dynamically. So sometimes I create packages at work where my email is different. Sometimes I create packages at home uh, where I use my personal email. I don't want to have to set that globally. So I am able to use this convenience function, which is just like wherever I happen to be, set my email depending on what computer I'm on. And again, this is not like objectively difficult stuff. You can always go back and change your email, but if you're doing this often enough, it becomes frustrating. And you should make friends with your frustration and you should go and you should fix it. The other thing which you can set in your R package is your prompt. So your prompt is the thing which appears just before your cursor when you set your prompt. So at the top line of this is uh, you can set options prompt equals. And I have set it in this example to the Lambda symbol because I want it to be cool. And lots of people in the Lisp community set it and like Hasklers set it to like the Lambda symbol. And I want it to be one of the cool kids. So I set the prompt is equal to Lambda. Um, and so you can see uh, now after I've done that, my the thing that appears before my prompt is uh, a Lambda symbol, and that's pretty cool. So I can be one of the cool kids now, but there's also the prompt package. Um, so if you go and you look up the, the prompt package, uh, you can get very, very fancy prompts. So in this example, which you'll see on screen uh, is like, this is a prompt that shows you what, um, if you're using Git, like what Git branch you're on, uh, what version uh, of, um, uh, the package you're using or something like that. Uh, and I think what your computer's name is. Um, so I'm sure it'll, it'll appear for me in a second. So yeah, it tells me how much memory I'm using. It tells me I'm on a Mac uh, and it tells me, I think maybe, yeah, an operating system version and it tells me I'm on the main branch. Um, and so yeah, you can get very fancy with that if you want to. Um, and so uh, yeah. Uh, that's that's another sort of like uh, fun thing which you can do uh, if you wanted to um, to set that kind of preference. So the other thing which you can set is you can uh, I choose to interact. Oh, sorry, not interactively, but I choose to script my R Studio preferences. So the R Studio API uh, package has a write R Studio preference, um, uh, which you can use uh, by using the set hook. Um, function, which is built into R. You don't need to worry too much about it, but um, uh, it has this um, this hook. So when an RStudio session initializes, um, you can pass it a function. And I've just chosen to to set my preferences within this this function hook. 
Um, so the first thing is I, I happen to use the, the Vim key bindings. So um, my editor key bindings I set to Vim. Uh, I never save my workspace uh, at, at the end, so I just use a clean workspace always. And so I, I, I recommend you do the same. Uh, I don't save my history uh, for better or for worse. Um, uh, and I choose to save my files before I build a package. Um, uh, there's a whole bunch of our studio preferences. You can go look them up, um, but these are just anything that you might think of in setting in the menu, like the preferences menu uh, in the RStudio IDE. You can, I, I choose not to set them there. I just script them into my, my init uh, session uh, where they're always there available for me. Um, uh, naturally, yeah, you will have different preferences. You might use different key bindings to the Vim key bindings. You can go set your own key bindings. Um, but again, if you have multiple machines like I do, um, it's worth just doing this in one place. So you always have those available to you. Um, and so those those always get, get written and always with you, no matter where you, you go. Uh, I mentioned before, like this is again, the beauty of version control. So you can have uh, you because this is just text, you can have this in version control somewhere. And if you make a change, you can just pull to get the latest changes, depending on where you happen to be working at the time. So I mentioned before about the shortcuts package, uh, and this is an example of what I spoke about before, where you don't actually want to run the shortcuts. Uh, or you don't actually want to load the shortcuts package in every single R version, I don't think. Um, so what I have is I have a convenience function which I load into my uh, my R session, uh, which I call JLS underscore set underscore shortcuts, um, which is just uh, if my shortcuts uh, come out of sync, then it's just a one. Uh, I just need to to run one function which uh, which take uh, which wraps this function in the shortcuts package, which sets my R Studio shortcuts for me. Um, uh, this is just yeah uh, to avoid having to, to run the shortcuts in every single R session. Uh, I just choose to, to wrap it in a, in a function. Uh, I recommend you follow this approach so you don't want to accidentally override another function. So what the, the way that lots of Emacs users do this and some other users too is you could prefix it with your own initials. Uh, so I do JLS, you, you do your own initials. But the, the cool thing about this is also that you get autocomplete. So if you just want a list of all of your uh, convenience functions, you can just type in your initials and they'll autocomplete so you can see them all there available to you. Um, and uh, yeah, there's uh, sometimes this can clutter your, um, uh, your, your workspace. And I have some suggestions in my R profile about how to avoid that, but that's maybe not for this talk. Um, but yeah, you can. This is a way of using packages when you don't want to use packages. Is just to, to wrap them into a um, a convenience function. So because I, I really care about this a lot, I've actually written my own package um, to make this a lot easier. So uh, my package is called Customizer. Um, it's or pronounced Customize R, I guess. Um, uh, so it's available on GitHub. Uh, it's not on CRAN yet because it's is relatively new. Uh, but the the customize R package uh, has a R Markdown template, and uh, basically it's a place where you can put the things that you want to include in your .R profile. And what it will do is when you hit the knit button, it'll just send like your um, your R code to the .R profile location. So it's always available to you. So you don't, uh, yeah, ideally, you don't want to really like have to worry about where that location is. For example, it changes between operating systems. So it'll be a bit different on a Mac to Windows to, to Linux. And if you're doing this a lot, um, the, the package will just find the correct location for you and automatically send the, um, the R code to that file. Um, so it's, again, it's, it's easy to use the version control and, um, uh, it's it's uh, it's an easy place. It's just a, an easy way to to write comments about what you're doing and um, and to control your your R experience. Um, this is the kind of uh, what it looks like at the start. So this is just uh, again an example of my R profile. Um, so there's a, a knit button and it just calls the one function in the package which is customize R customize R. Um, and I, if you uh, if you wanted to allow uh, overwrites um, 
uh, it allows you to overwrite the if there is a an R profile there already, uh, you can say that it um, uh, you want to overwrite that by default whenever you you hit the knit button. Um, so basically, what I do is I, I use I I have like the dot R profile is like a compilation target, which is like I don't want to care about that. I just want to go to this file and I want to just send R codes to where the the correct place that it should be, and I don't want to care about where my operating system has that file. And so yeah, if you if you don't want to learn about like the R profile necessarily, the customized R package might be a way for you to. To, to get the benefits of that without having to, to dig too much or do too much work like synchronizing your R profile between um, between different sessions. So yeah, that is most of what I have. Like the takeaways I think from this talk are, like I said at the very start, R is a fantastic interactive environment already. It also has a fantastic IDE in R Studio, but they both of those things are also highly configurable. And so uh, you are allowed and encouraged to use the facilities within the language and within the IDE to customize your experience of using them. On a broader note, I also think that the R community in general could benefit from having more of this kind of thing. So more configuration sharing, more um, examples that people can draw on. If you disagree with like my approach, on anything, you should be free to say so, and you should be able to publish your own config, um, which does those things and other people should be able to learn from you. Uh, and I think the customize R package makes this a little bit easier. Um, and I think that as the R community, we have a lot to learn from other programming languages. Notably, I think this happens a lot in Emacs. So Emacs, you, like everybody does this just as a matter of course. It's just understood that, you know, you don't use Emacs with the default configuration. Every, you know your experience of of actually programming means that you should change your editor and you should change uh, the, the the language in this in that case is Emacs Lisp, but you should really craft your experience of programming as much as you can to try and avoid like the frustrations which sometimes go along with um, particular tasks in programming. And yeah, that is that is all I have. Uh, but I'm very happy to uh, to take any of your questions or go back to to things which you um, uh, which you might want to talk about. Well, questions can go in the Q and A, and then I'll feed them. But I can, yeah, you know, chair's privilege. I think I heard today at well, a different meeting, so I'm going to do that. So you talking about your frustration become something. What's the process of having something that's frustrating and then finding it because it seems for me my own experience is possibly just relying too much on serendipity where you go oh yeah that because I wouldn't know I didn't know for example that there was a profile in R, R studio I once changed it somebody had suggested you can change your theme settings to light or dark according to the time and I posted it in there and then forgot all about it and so I kept at like six o'clock it would change but of course the times changed and I didn't know what I'd done so um, I hadn't looked for it and it caused a new frustration but then is there a thought process that you go through like a step by step to find the answers to your frustrations particularly when it's something really really new to you? Yeah, so I think the things which I've talked about in uh, in the in the balance of the talk are the the tools that empower you to do that. So the fact that you the you listeners now know that the R profile exists, it, it's now um, you can you can look into that as an avenue of like I might want to customize this. So in your case, you might want to say like read sys dot time. And if sys.time is between like I don't know six and you know, the sun the sun sets very early in this country. I'm, I'm not from this country. I, I um, so I uh, you know the, the sun sets on a hopper's four or something ridiculous. So if sys.time is greater than than four p.m., then R Studio API uh, apply theme. And yeah, the but knowing that the R profile exists uh, is. Uh, uh, basically empowers you to to do that. I think there's a there's a couple other examples which are which are in the talk, knowing that the the set hook function exists, which you know you can look at a bunch of uh, hooks which um, based, they're named that way because they hook into different functionality. So when something runs, um, you can you can run something after that. Um, 
but thereafter, I don't really, uh, beyond like knowing the available tools, I don't really have a good answer because again, it's something which, which I, which is kind of, I've just internalized into myself, which is just that I know what frustrates me. And I think that people come with a thing where, I mean, my, in fact, I know this is the case. People come with an attitude where they think if, if they're encountering frustration, that they are the problem. So, you know, they think that, you know, I'm not smart enough. Or I don't have the patience for this. And we see intelligence and patience as good qualities. But I think that frustration is actually the positive quality. Frustration is knowing the value of your time. And uh, patience is just an overrated virtue in my experience. So you should want things to be as smooth and as streamlined as possible, especially if you're a programmer because you you have the tools um, to um, to make that change for yourself if you want to. And yeah, this talk is, is about just empowering you to do that, I guess. Yeah, um, I, I I, think, I've also yeah. given you the, yeah, mm -hmm. I've, I've also given the example of it. If you really want to, if you're a very frustrated person, yeah, go use Emacs. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, there's there's always there's always something available to you. Yes, I think you're right. Um, I've noticed this with our users, particularly self-taught. They'll go so far, and it's not for want of log uh, intelligence that they don't know. When you don't know, you don't know. So you can get quite far with R, for example, without ever having encountered a function that you need to create yourself. But as soon as you repeat your code or you get you know, somebody says, "Hey, have you looked at this?" It can just change everything. But it's not because you didn't get it you're slow it's because it's just knowledge that you didn't pick up or nobody had mentioned so um, exactly. I totally agree with you and on languages uh, you mentioned Haskell I know we're in an R thing but there's um, a colleague of mine who I kind of time how quickly it is before he gets into the word Haskell because he's very taken with it so exploring other languages can be really useful because I think a lot of analysts particularly in the NHS come with SQL so we don't have that functionality functions or, or changing your environment possibility so that's like you can do this this is a possibility it can be done in code it's it's quite liberating but it's it's that step of knowing that it exists oh that's fantastic yeah that's, other... that's the reason that's the reason I, I mentioned emacs quite a lot which is uh not because i'm very good at emacs in fact i'm very bad at emacs um mm -hmm. but uh the uh, the emacs community is just such an inspiration in their um they're they're wanting to 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 customize their own experience. Is that they um they uh, their attitude is they to change first. Is that um, you know my editor changes for me. I don't change for my editor. Um and that's um that's the inspiration behind the the customizer package. Um so what you can do in Emacs is you can um uh, they have a similar thing where you can create uh, what in Emacs is called an org mode file. And it, and you can use it to write your init.e.el, um, which is the code that runs every time you start up Emacs. Um, but equally, uh, so I have a, the customizer our um, uh, Markdown template, which enables you to write your R profile, which is the same philosophy, which is just you want a literate configuration, uh, and you want to be able to just target um, your uh, your your dot file. Um, as like a compilation target. So, but it speaks to your point, which is that you know programming languages can inspire. Which is that you know there are there are good things in, in almost every programming language, um, which we can um, which we can learn from, and which we you know without knowing them we wouldn't we wouldn't know what we're missing out on. And also um, how you can you can create a package for your own add-ins. So like Data Pasta and style R are packages, but they have changed the R Studio layout. Uh, a colleague of mine, Matt Dre, has also created two, one for package Roxygen code and the other one for Quarto code, to, just to alleviate that retyping of things. And I, my mind was blown when I first saw those because now you don't have to type it. There are other ways actually in R Studio, but this was a really nice way of just loading a package and then it's there and you can click on it and choose the bit that you want. It stops you having to do that, like typing your name. I'm finding that typing reproducible analytical pipelines is a very long word. The shortening is great, wrap, but sometimes you need it. You need that shortcut that you can get. I like the shortcuts. And so maybe that's the thing is the frustrations. They don't have to be the big things. They can even be just a tiny things. Like I'm, I've got an unusual character in my name and I 
I use shortcuts for it for the E. Uh, lots of colleagues are a bit like, how do you do that? And I, I don't expect people to know it because I use that name more than most. <laughs> so yeah. I type it. I kind of need the shortcuts. But yeah, yeah. we're all looking yeah. for some shortcuts in our work. I mean, for the rest of us just have to Google Beyonce and like copy and paste yeah, it from <laughs> Beyonce. Well, I, I actually do it uh, myself. So depending on where, where I am, I put Zoe Umlaut and I get it from Wikipedia. Right. I copy it and paste it. <laughs> Hopefully right. it's not the wrong yeah. font size, though. Right. But that's wonderful. Yeah. The one thing I didn't mention, which you'll correct point out, is like there's a whole world of snippets out there. Mm. So our studio has a snippet functionality and you can save. Uh, your own snippets and it's not something I use quite enough but yeah just those uh, that repeated code um, uh, just be able to like tab complete through um, like the arguments of a function or, or something like that it's also really valuable but it's, it's a yeah, meta practice. I discovered looking at mastering shiny book from Hadley Wickham so there's a shout out there as well um, if you type shiny I think it is and then tabs it tab or tab set or, or control and tab because I use Windows, not Mac. It does the template for you, the sort of like bare bones template, and it will just like a snippet. It will just fill it in for you and little things like that. It's like Easter eggs. Our studio seems to be full of them, and then you can add your own. <laughs> yeah. It's brilliant. There's quite a fun thing also, uh, which is quite smart uh, in use this and test. Uh, yeah, in the use this package. So use this. You can go use underscore r which will create an R file in your R directory. Um, but what you can do is if you're in an R file, you can use use underscore test and it will create uh, a file of the with the same name in your tests folder. So it will learn the name of your currently active document and it will use that uh, in as the, the file name in, of the equivalent uh, file in your tests folder. So little things like that, which you, you didn't know that you loved until you saw them and then they're great. And you don't yeah. want to go back. I've been using the use this package for its Git functionality as well with pull requests. And um, I went to a meeting today talking about Git, but really all I was talking about was R because R sort of made it easier for me to use Git. So when people were saying, how did you get into Git and GitHub? It's like R did it. <laughs> I've, I've used yeah. a lot of other languages, but through R, and they make it just easy and yeah. go with it. Take away the frustration. That's that seems to be an R thing generally, and that's what we're working towards. Thank you for that and adding to that, <laughs> removing more frustration points. Okay. Um, just to remind everybody that we'll be having future. We'll be putting in the future um, sessions for the workshops that would not work well. We've got workshops. We've got webinars will be going into a new year and doing some planning for that please do get in touch if you would like to do a webinar or a workshop we do the introduction to r and r studio uh, every month which is very popular but if you have another session or another workshop that you would like to share with the community please do come along get in touch at nhs.rcommunity at nhs.net and the details are on our website which is nhsrcommunity.com and I'd like to say thank you for everybody again and certainly to James for coming to share all of this information and we'll see you again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Goodbye. Goodbye.